Hello, everybody. Chris Martinson here. And today we're going to be talking about finance and economics as part of Finance U. Remember, anything that you see in this video and all resources available at our websites or affiliated websites are not intended as or construed as financial advice. This is for educational purposes. Remember, if you have a financial decision, please consult a financial professional. We are not attorneys. We're not CPAs. We are not financial managers as well. We do our best to be accurate and everything we represent is as accurate as we know it to be. Now, let's turn to our program. It's really important that they have both the appearance of being fair and transparent, as well as, as much as possible, the reality of that. Once you remove that, right, if people lose the sense that they have, that markets are free and fair, well, then you get chaos. Like, people don't trust the markets, and, and you, know, you have to have higher risk premium, and they get more volatile, and eventually someday they, you, you do it so much that they ultimately break. Hey, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Finance University. I am Chris Martinson, CEO of Peak Financial Investing, also of Peak Prosperity. And with me back today, Paul Kiker of Kiker Wealth Management. Paul, big day today. Let's happy, talk about it. Yeah, happy hot inflation day today, Chris. How are you? Oh, well, it's always a bittersweet day for me because the government has to admit something it doesn't want to admit, and I know they're lying, and it's actually much hotter than admitted. Right. You know, right. if we were in a, if we were in a relationship with the government, this would be the part where they call trickle true thing. Right. <laughs> oh, no, honey. I was not with that woman. Oh, well, we only held hands. We might have kissed once. Right. It's just, you know, until you get to the actual truth <laughs> of the whole situation. Right? Uh, right. So inflation, they've been lying about it for a long time. I actually have a really killer article here. I want to talk with you about very quickly about how hard this is for people. Anybody out there who's listening right now, if you are offended, hurt, injured by inflation, I need you to understand that those are real, legitimate emotions. And by the way, those are actual policies that are being run by people to specifically accomplish those ends. I don't know if they care if you're mad about it, but they are trying to use inflation as a means of taking from you to support their debt-addicted ways. So, Paul, what's your take on today's inflation? Well said. I was actually... I was curious. I was straddling the fence mentally coming into it. I'm like, based on everything that I'm seeing and what I'm hearing in the data leading into today, we should see a hotter than expected print. But, you know, you take into consideration labor statistics and how that's gained for their benefit, I thought, well, mm -hmm. this is the window if we're going to have a miss that they can, you know, if they can get the data below, then that gives the Fed the ability to put on the calendar a rate cut prior to the election. So I was really surprised that the data came out hotter than expected because this is the last real manipulative window that they have to be able to try to set on the calendar a rate cut prior to the election without getting into the political scene there. So so I was shocked, and especially the fact that it beat across the board all components of the CPI were hotter than expected. Now, and, and that means we're four months in a row of hotter than expected CPI data. And since this you know administration cycle has taken place, we're up, what, 19% overall um, in inflation data. We've not seen that, that cool off a bit. So it was a bit surprising that the data came in hot officially, but it wasn't surprising that the data came in hot based on everything that we're seeing take place under the surface and all the components come in. Uh, I'm just not surprised because I've been to the grocery store in the past week. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, it's and, no, it's really painful. It is. So look, can I just set the, set the stage for people real quick? Um, so this is uh, Powell's core indicator. So this is the thing that tanked the odds of a rate cut. So there was a lot of, you know, pre-hysteria in the stock markets because we wanted a rate cut, whatever that means in today's world where they don't actually, nothing actually happens. They just tell you it's a new rate and no money changes hands. It's a weird thing. But anyway, this is the Powell indicator, core services, X shelter. And you know, this is the weird thing. They start stripping stuff out, Paul, you know, X shelter, like Paul Krugman a, a couple months ago, he's like, Oh, we're winning on inflation. I told you we would. X food, gas, shelter, and healthcare. We're doing great. Like, like what kind of a knucklehead are you? Ivory Princeton knucklehead. Um, right. So at any rate, you can see here. So this goes all the way back to, um, that. what's that, like 
first quarter 2023. So we're a year in. And as you can see, this line is going up, not mm -hmm. down. So this is that's what he's looking at is this core thing. There's no not a chance of a rate cut when you have inflation coming up here. And by the way, this is at a pretty legend. This is a pretty high level overall. Mm -hmm. That really now, is. You know, it's serious because uh, the bonds, this is the 10 year note. Mm -mm. That is a that is a penny stock kind of a move there. That was a pretty aggressive uh, instantaneous reaction on the 10 year. So it had all kinds of impacts. And then this is the one that gets me is, um, is, uh, this is the CPI cumulative over time. So the index, this back to some number back in, in 1996, you know, the index is at, um, what equals hundred, that number right there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the index at hundred and then you start climbing up and you can see it had been at inflation has just been at sort of this steady ish line since we came off the gold standard. This is a very new departure. This is a big deal. Been trying to warn people about that on a year over year basis. This this is the same data, but just presented on a percent year over year. You can see the bad old 70s here, right? Spiked up to what was that, 14% inflation or something. And then all this time they're like, oh, oh, inflation's coming down. You had the, the press secretary, Jean Corinne from, from the White House saying, oh, Americans are paying less because she confused rates with amounts. Anyway, it's a rookie mistake, but that's how it is. But this looks like it's getting better, but people are starting to wonder, Paul, and this is what I wanted to talk to you about today. This is the experience in the 70s. It went up, it came down, and everybody's, oh, we've whipped inflation now, and we're all happy, and then it, and then it had its final run. People are wondering, are we just going to repeat this? Is this just the 70s all over again? So that's the setup, at least for this first part. I just want to talk about that, because is inflation, it feels entrenched to me. You know, it hasn't gone down like it has been going up since that first quarter of 2023. It's like it's not it's up 12 report, you know, it, some little wiggles in the middle, but it's not going down. It's going the wrong way. It is going in the, the wrong way and outside the expectations and basically the propaganda that, that the leaders, politicians have been putting upon the American people is like, hey, you know, inflation is going down. It's you. It's not the data, well, but everybody goes, everything that you need in society that you need to live on is going up. And we all know that, unless you've got somebody else that's making the purchases for you. So, you know, there are arguments that inflation is cyclical historically, but once it gets bedded in the economy historically, it, it comes back and it does look like we're tracking that 1970s inflationary birth pain, right? So we had the initial birth pain, it grows up, it subsides for a little bit, it looks like this next set of birth pain is starting. And especially with the fiscal responsibility that the government's putting out right now, you know, all of the just just spending us into oblivion in the Federal Reserve. Obviously, when we look at this data, monetary policy is not as restrictive as they claim it is, or they believe that it is. Because We've had plenty of time for the rate, the lag effect of the rate hikes to take effect and start impacting the economy, but that's just not the case of what's taking place right now. So, yeah, it, it's a game changer for investors. It's a game changer if that is true and we have another birth pain coming and we're going to track the 1970s. The playbook that's worked for the past 20 years is not going to work for the next 10. There's no doubt about that. So let's talk. So we talk about inflation like it's a number, like it's one thing, you know, 0.4% month over month. That was the rate of inflation. Not true. It depends on your personal experience with this. Um, so let me look at this real quick. See if I, yeah, I can fit on there. So this comes from the Kobesi letter, or however you pronounce that, Kobesi letter on Twitter. I like them. They, they I got some great uh, financial reporting. So anybody who wants to follow them, give them a follow. Good stuff. Really they is. say, while well, CPI is at 3.5% or higher, let's look at this on subcomponents. Car insurance inflation year over year, 22.2%. Uh -huh. So for people who can't substitute car insurance for eating fewer carrots, because, you know, however the, they do that crazy stuff in the government statistician office, you can't avoid car insurance unless you're not going to drive. This is insane. 22% uh -huh. year over year? On average? Uh-huh. Ouch. Transportation inflation, 10.7%. Um, car repair inflation, 8.2%. Hospital services, 75 Remember those two, the car repair and hospital, because I got one more chart that, that's, uh, that sort of 
I got questions, right? I was going to argue. inflation, five. Yeah, yeah, Sorry, yeah, was, save your arguments. I was going to argue that car repair inflation is <laughs> a lot higher than 8.2 because I had to have some car work and my daughter did recently and I think she cried yeah. for 30 minutes. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, but it's it's a it's a thing. And by the way, just for everybody listening, I said, you know, I think the government fibs about these things. My starting position is I take any of these percentages and I double them. And you know what, Paul, over the long haul, I'm more right than not about these things. Correct. So um, and then we got uh, homeowner inflation, five, nine rent inflation, five, seven year over year. So if you're not getting a six percent bump in your salary. Just to hold steady, you're getting eaten alive by homeowner and, and, and you know, car repair and hospital services, all this stuff, right? Electricity mm -hmm. inflation, 5%, that bleeds into a lot of things. And food away from home is kind of like the only thing I can see you can avoid here if you choose at 4.2, right? So this is bad. Now, this was an interesting chart. Look, look at this one. I'm going to full screen this one. So these are price changes in the U.S. over the past five years. So this is five years. But top left up here, um, we have here, uh, we've got vehicle repair at 49.8%, right? Good. Household repair at 49.4%, right? These are all horrifying frozen juices, right? But they say, they tell me, this is official, this comes from the uh, BLS, but they say that health insurance has gone down 3% in the last five years. What? <laughs> That's what they say. How? In what world? Right there. Uh, in the world where you're being shamelessly lied to and gaslit by reckless bureaucrats who hate you. No kid. That's what they say, though. Health insurance is down 3%. And the only way I can connect this miserable chart to current narratives is I see that Women's apparel and outerwear are all in the green and they're down. So maybe that's why they want more people cross-dressing. <laughs> that's good. I'm shocked about health I don't insurance. Know. I mean, that, there's, you know, that's the, the largest hurdle for small businesses. It's the largest hurdle for individuals that retire before the age of 65. Used to, I remember before 2010, we would have a lot of individuals that would save well, come in, you know, especially if they had a somewhat of a pension, they're 62. It's easy to fill in that gap from 62 to 65 uh, with insurance. You know, you could get covered for three, four, or five hundred dollars a month if you didn't have pre-existing conditions. Now you're talking about mm -hmm. two, two thousand dollars a month without hardly any benefits, and you're still paying out of pocket for everything. So I, I do not see how how health insurance. No, that's a bald face lie. Much. Bald face yeah. lie. I, I, I actually have to buy family coverage, and um, and we've been up. Our smallest year in the past five years was twelve point eight percent, and our highest year was twenty two ish percent, just under. Yeah. So a double digit increase is for me, right? So this one really this what this offends me. This offends me. This idea of them trying to claim that over the past five years health insurance is down three yeah. percent. When my experience uh, with those double digits, if I actually add them up, probably be closing in on sixty five, seventy percent. Um, mm -hmm. cause that's a compounding thing, not just additive. Right. So, um, yeah, horrifying, horrifying. Um, so, so that, that brings me, that brings me to something. Can I, can I do, this was, uh, I want to get your opinion on this. So this is in the wall street journal. This is in, um, Monday, April 8th, and this is called falling through the cracks. And apparently I didn't know this, but there's an emergency number. You can call two one one, not nine one one. You call two one one when you're in a financial emergency. And there's all these people who, who are going to help you and figure out what programs, you know, and where the food banks are and what you qualify for, right? So this is fascinating. They say here, quote, we wonder why there's so much anger in public discourse today. And it's in part because of the stress people feel just to keep themselves and their families afloat. So they call these people Alice, A-L-I-C-E for asset limited, income constrained, employed. So your asset limited, income constrained, and employed. So these are just people they're working, they're playing the game, they're doing what they can, but they're Alice, right? They are they don't have many assets because we know all those floated up to the top thanks to the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. Um and they're income constrained, but they're employed, right? So get this. How many uh, 36 million American households or 29% fell into this category in 2021? 
But in nearby Hartford, where the cost of living, Hartford, Connecticut, where the cost of living outpaces the national, national average, 38% of households, 38%, 30, 4 out of 10 fit that description. Now, here's the, here's the, here's the money shot. Now, to, they say that they have to turn almost all of these struggling families away because the federal poverty level for a family of four stands at 31200 But United Way of Connecticut estimates that the bare minimum survival budget, and Connecticut's a high-cost state, bare minimum survival budget for a family of four with two young children in the state is $126,000. Now, wow. this is where it gets real, because you know why we have a federal minimum poverty of 31200 Because they set that back in 1980, and they've been adjusting it by their ultra-fictitious inflation things. It sounds, you know, we sort of complain about, oh, yeah, the government's lying about inflation. What's yeah. the cost? Well, the cost is that when a family's struggling, they can't get help because they're above the federal minimum, which mm -hmm. they hold down so they don't have to spend any money on U.S. families. If you're a migrant coming into New York City, $136,000 a year they spend on these families to help them get settled. They spend that much on them when they come mm -hmm. in to per help Per person, not per family. 136,000. My goodness. So what would you they think They put them of... up in hotels. No, go ahead, finish that line of thought. Yeah, I they put them up in hotels. They have they have all these programs available to them, on and on and on, you know, and then they get them housing like red carpet, they roll it out, right? But for our mm -hmm. own families who are struggling, I'm sorry, nothing for you. You're above the federal minimum poverty level. We got rules. But no. it's just, so when people are getting angry, they should get angry, right? They should. They should be angry. I mean, you, you just go back to student loans. That's the one loan that you can't default on, but yet students are paying three, four times what uh, treasury rates are for a risk-free loan for the lender. I mean, if we really care about our families, so the way I, I think about this, I try to bring it out, when I talk to people, bring it down to an understandable level. So, Chris, what do you think people would think about if there was a family that was close to them and dad goes and takes his entire paycheck and and gives it to every other child in town and goes and supports them and doesn't feed his own family within that home? I mean, it, as a country, we are a family, right? We're a blended family. We're an adoptive family of folks that come in and we're not taking care of our people for what? for virtue signaling to say, hey, we're doing great things. That's not great things. When you have a father or a mother that doesn't take care of their own household, first and foremost, if there's something left over, yes, you're a blessing to other people. But if you don't take care of your, your immediate family, first and foremost, you're terrible parents. You're terrible leaders. You're terrible individuals because you care more about what others think than your own family that you have power over. That's, that's just horrendous. In the data. Yeah, no, that's like a, it's a great point. It's like it's like, oh no, we're showing we're caring by taking care of these people, but you, but if you're abusing these people and neglecting them, that doesn't show that you're a caring person about humans. No, no, not at all. Right? It, remi it reminds me of a joke. I forget which comedian said this, but it was great. He said, "When you're on a plane traveling with two children and the three oxygen masks pop down, you put yours on first. And then think carefully about who you put on next, because the other one will remember that for the rest of their life. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you, with our three kids, that's 100% true. They would know exactly who got it first. <laughs> that's good. But yeah, that's right. You got to take care yeah. of your own household first. And that, that's the heartbreaking thing. There are, there are tons of families out there, hardworking. They're flying underneath the radar. They're not politically expedient because they're not supporting this woke agenda that have integrity. They've done what was the propaganda that was pushed upon them. Hey, if you go to college and you get an education, hey, you can borrow this money. Maybe there's, a, you know, a, an employer that will pay that off for you, you know, and, and then they make it easy. You know, there's a lot of individuals that go through college and they're not borrowing money just simply for their education. They're borrowing it to go on spring break and party and, you know, foolishly waste it because they make it so easy for them. And then they hit reality. They come into the workforce and all of this propaganda that's been put before them to tell them, hey, you know, this is your expectation is not reality. And and, and I don't know if it's planned. It, it It's at a minimum foolish it's at worst evil, pure evil, because because it's just breaking our own individuals. And then we're sending all this money overseas and trying to promote our agendas on all of these other countries around the world 
when we need to be re- spending that money on infrastructure and and tax incentives for affordable housing, you know, block institutions out of purchasing residential housing so that our our families, our citizens, our, our Americans can be able to afford homes. Because right now, I think it's still, I don't know the stats today, but somewhere around 15% of households in the U- United States are the only ones earning enough income to buy the median family home where the interest rates are right now. I need to look that up. I forget, Chris, when we're on this, that I can actually I, go I pulled, out and look I that pulled up. That, I pulled that stat just for you here. Okay. Um, this is U.S. home affordability. We're down to 16%. That means an affordable uh, listing has a monthly um, mortgage component that uh, you know that is no more than thirty percent of your total take home, right? Only sixteen yeah. percent of families can afford the so-called median house now, huh? Only sixteen percent, you said, correct? Yeah. Yep. That's horrifying. That's that's terrible, you know. Um, but. But while all this is happening, again, so this is like, you know, I don't want to just stir up everybody to get all, get, I, I think anger's good. So there's two types of anger. One's just drama. You're Karen, mm-hmm. you're yelling at the manager. I'm not talking about that. There's another kind of anger, which is, which is motivating, which allows you to put up a, a defense that says, stop, just stop mm-hmm. with this already. And, and this is important to me because this, right? It turns out that now 44% of all single family home purchases in 2023 were by private investors and a big chunk of those were institutional, right? So 44%. at the same time, yeah, 44%. So, so they buy them and then the next thing you know, they're charging us extraordinary rent. But where did those, where did the private investors get all that money? Well, it was printed up and handed out to them by the Federal Reserve. Mm-hmm. If you check, there's a couple of steps in there, but really, honestly, that is the program. So that's astonishing. And you know, that whole thing where they told us that you'll own nothing uh, and be happy. And that's a commandment, you know, um, more, not a suggestion, but that's. Mm-hmm. 44% of all homes being sold to, to private investors, right? Mm-hmm. Well, the only people who can really do private investing in homes, I mean, there's some mom and pop and, and, and there's some relative, right. you know, landlording that I totally am supportive, but we're mostly not talking about that right now. We're talking about big money. Right. Where did right. they get that big money? It was printed up and handed to them by these people who have the printing press. So by the way, resist every effort for us to audit them and find out where and what they're doing. That's exactly right. With your money. And what's frustrating about that, Chris, is I don't have any issues with an individual, even if it's an LLC, they go out, they buy three, four or five rental properties. They accumulate those over time because you have a relationship with those tenants. You're still on a close, uh, local level, even if it's around the country, as far as rental properties, You've got to go get approved for that loan. You don't have access to the cheap money that you can get through Wall Street. It's a completely different individual to compete with when you can go put together a prospectus. You can gain corporate investors. You've got, you know, and you're a price insensitive buyer. Mom and pop are not price insensitive uh, rental home purchasers or VRBO purchasers, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're an institution, you're coming in, you've got 200 million that you've got to put to work and you want to allocate in a certain state, you're just going in and trying to buy a whole community or subdivision. And it seems to me a pretty simple fix. Like, let's just put a moratorium on institutions buying any uh, retail homes until we can get back to where 60% of the population can afford the median home price, right? So um it, it, it's it's something that i don't understand why it can't be fixed and maybe it's just that we need enough people that are re- reaching out to your senators and congressmen and your political leaders and pushing in a voice to say look you've got to do something about this and you got to do something about it now yeah well if if they had any capability of asking them and answering those questions um i've not been too impressed with our leaders of late <laughs> <laughs> to no. be honest, I think they lack the they they lack the framing, the appropriateness. I don't know if you saw this, but but some congresswoman was lecturing everybody during the eclipse that the that the moon is mostly made of gases, so we can we can go there someday. I'm like, <laughs> I thought that was a when I first saw it, I thought that was a headline by the Babylon Bee. Right. I was like, there's no way that's real. <laughs> when I when I first saw the headline, I was like, that's really good that they came up with that. And I was like, oh, no, that was somebody really actually said that. And the, somebody I know. What a moron. A yeah. Moron. It's cheese. We all know it's made out of cheese, uh, obviously. <laughs> I mean, no. <laughs> but again, I mean, just uh, it's just it's it's uh, it's a thing. 
Um, so uh, one other thing I wanted to talk with you about today, because I, I think that this is really much bigger than um, is publicly recognized. And I know some people have done some great work about this, Mark Skidmore, and I know that Catherine Austin Fitz has looked into this, but but I just started really looking into this thing too, which is um, this whole thing where the government legalized secret defense spending for itself, right? And this Tybee article is interesting because it talks about this really arcane accounting standards, FAS 56, whatever, uh, permits mm -hmm. government agencies to modify public financial statements and move expenditures from one item to another also expressly allows federal agencies to refrain from telling taxpayers if and when fi public financial statements have been altered. Um, and and then I, I dug into this further, Paul, and I discovered that it, it actually goes beyond that. Um, there is a, a, a part of the code which is written out, which I pulled out for my subscribers uh, back at Peak Prosperity. We've been talking about this. And it turns out that um, the Director of National Intelligence has the capability to ta order or co-opt or allow, whatever the language is, private companies to misstate their financial returns as well. They are no longer subject to proper um, GAAP, good accounting um, practices, right? And th th they can just don't have to report appropriately um, because of national security. But if, it's like, what? No due what? process. <laughs> and that individual has the power to, to make that decision, correct? With no due process, no yes. legal processing. Yes. Wow. Yep, because it's because it's a national security. So what did we find out about this last year? Or so I fell I fell afoul of this heavy, so it's a little bit personal for me, but I got censored, I got suppressed. I I ran into this buzzsaw that a lot of people ran into, which was like, "Oh, you're telling unapproved narratives." And then we found out because of the Missouri v. Biden uh, uh lawsuit by those attorney generals down there that in fact they had been censoring all kinds of stuff, including a parody account that was making fun of the president, including um, you know, just anything that they deemed that they didn't want to have out there. So the government was weighing heavily on these social media companies to get them to throttle, suppress, pull, ban, whatever they had to do. So this was, this is, this is my, this is my question about this. Like, is that connected to this? Right. Why is it that the Magnificent Seven, which does include Tesla, which I think we'll have to call this the Magnificent Six now, because Tesla is no longer uh, the darling child in this story, but um, up through January of 24, they had had positive 4% earnings and revenue surprises, um, whereas every other company in the S&P 500 was down double digits at minus 15%. And that just stuck. We've talked about it before. I've shown this chart. Mm -hmm. It's been on this channel before. I'm just like, well, that's weird. All of these companies that are involved in that stuff were companies that were named in that mm -hmm. suit. They were working hand in glove with the government. Mm-hmm. How much money did they get paid for that? Because it sounded for a little while like, you know, they just, we were just asking them to do this stuff. I'm like, there's nothing like asking. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> how there's much were we money. asking? Mm -hmm. You know? And, and, and so this was my final commentary on that, which was this, which is the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, you know, they had been projecting just a month ago, $1.5 trillion deficit for 2024. And now we're on track to have a $2.2 trillion deficit, and this is weird. I have questions, because the CBO, when they put their budget deficit estimates together, they're working off of known appropriations, known laws and known appropriations. So they just add it up. They're very rarely wrong by 30, in this case, 50%. This is going to be a 50% miss this year, $700 billion. I have questions. Where did that money go? My money, your money. Yeah. Nobody knows. Yeah. Well, and if you take the other deceit that's come out of Washington at this point, right? The the revision of the numbers and and the common unbelief in the numbers that are coming out, you know, initially. But hey, they're revised in the dark when nobody's paying attention, and the computer algorithms don't trade mm -hmm. based off of the revised numbers; they trade off the headline numbers. And then you've got the drawdown of the Strategic Petroleum Reserves for political purposes and the only thing holding these markets up at this point really there's been moments where some of the other markets have tried to come other uh, companies have tried to help broaden out the rally is that magnificent seven you know is there enough circumstantial evidence there to say hey this is strictly just to try to keep the markets up to keep you know for political purposes going in because i don't understand why it would be a security risk to 
to hide the earnings reports of a publicly traded company. I don't, I mean, do you, can you justify why they would do that, Chris? Nah, they're, the only option I've come up with that I can sort of make sense of in their rationalization framework, because that's what you need for an overt fraud, right? You need to have the mm -hmm. means, the opportunity, and then the rationalization, right? Um, at least that's what CPAs look for. So in this case, the rationalization would be, hey, we're funneling tens of billions of dollars to these companies to have them help us fight misinformation, malinformation, disinformation. There's this horrible thing. We're trying to prevent the bad orange man from coming back, whatever the rationalization is. And it, oh, by the way, it would be really embarrassing for us if people found out how many billions we were paying to these companies for that. Right. So that's the only thing that makes sense to me. Is that yeah, they're doing that magnificently sense. well because <laughs> they're, they're, they're in the they're in the payola loop. That makes sense. And if there's no checks and balances in place and no no accountability, who's to say that we don't see that abused for the family members of that former government employee when they leave government service and go into the private sector? Or, hey, I'll exercise my powers here. You take care of my kids and my brother and my sister. And, you know, they all have these cushy jobs when they leave their government positions to go out there. You know, that that's just not right. That's not a fiduciary responsibility for the American people. It's 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 self-centered, hedonistic and and open for all kinds of, of problems. And and we don't need the narrative. You know, that's one of the things that Jordan Peterson talked about talks about from time to time. He's so eloquent in the way he explains it, like you're you are so eloquent in the way you explain things. He's like, tell the truth no matter what, because whatever outcome the truth leads you to is the right path, right? That's the right mm -hmm. path. And that's yep. the path where it brings our country together. It brings our family together. So, so, Hey, this is what it is. Let's get rid of these politicians. Let's put the right people in there. Let's start paying attention to, you know, to who the candidates are, not just who they tell us they are. Uh, but the truth is what we need. That's the only way we're going to bring back the American dream is to get back and have the courage to embrace the truth and love the truth. And I don't know how without the American people doing their best to try to hold their local state and national representatives accountable and pestering them uh, to do the right thing that, that this is going to change until things fall apart. You know, and if, if there's enough, if they can't hide this anymore and, and things come apart or inflation takes off from this point, maybe the American people will have enough pain where they're going to rise up and demand honesty and truth and integrity out of our leaders. Well, this is why, th thank you for that, because uh, this is really important to me. And here, here's why. I, I don't just poke at these things, Paul, because I want people to go, wow, that's messed up. It's that there's always the appearance and then the reality. And those two things together combine what we call our, our experience with something. So the markets, it's really important that they have both the appearance of being fair and transparent, as well as, as much as possible, the reality of that. Mm -hmm. Once you remove that, right? If people lose the sense that they have, that markets are free and fair, well, then you get chaos. Like people don't trust the markets and, the, and you know, you have to have higher risk premium and they get more volatile. And eventually someday that you, you do it so much that they ultimately break. We're watching this with the judiciary right now, right? Coming up with mm -hmm. these crazy, they're not, it, it used to be that what a judge's job was to do was, was to look at the law and decide, are we, is this a, you know, in violation with the law or not? Now they're ruling right? I've right. decided that this is what I think should happen here, right? And, and it has nothing to do with what the law actually says. Okay, that's our social contract. If that starts to break down, you get chaos after that. People start making up their own minds going, you know, it's kind of a broken, corrupt system. Why should I follow the rules myself, right? Mm -hmm. it, it goes far enough and you decide only suckers follow the rules. They get behind. Mm -hmm. The people who get ahead aren't constrained by that kind of you know, formalities. Yeah. And that happens with our money system. And so that's the direction we're going. That's why I so completely believe in what you're doing and helping people do, because th this is financial freedom is going to be really important. But we have to understand the degree to which our financial system has risks embedded within it. And yes. I if, if what I've just showed you, if, if there are secret, you know, uh, you know, reports or, or financial reports are being queered for narrative control. Or just to stop embarrassment, that's potentially explosive. People need to know about it.
It really is. And, you know, and we've talked before about you have to play the game by the rules that are forced upon you, not as you know it should be, right? Like, I would give anything if I could influence the system to the point that truth, integrity, accountability, and full disclosure was there. Yeah, you've got to have some national secrets to protect your country. But when it comes to the financial markets, it needs to be open and free. And, of course, you know, a, a headline comes out today just to, to show further evidence, you know, Zero Hedge put out uh, scandal rocks Biden's Labor Department for lying about sharing non-public inflation data with a secret group of Wall Street super users. So in the mm -hmm. article, which I can show it if we if we need to, it goes on to talk about basically they're getting data and having conversations about that data before it gets out to the average uh, individual. So that's not fair and equitable information, right? That gives them an advantage, and that is not – that that's corrupt. It really is. Why? Why are they doing it? And why is there not, you know, people losing their jobs, losing their pensions and potential jail time over that? So well, I would there should, get, because if you and I did that, if we did the equivalent of that, they would call that insider trading. Absolutely. It's a very serious charge. And you would be taken away in a perp walk with handcuffs. And they'd, they'd yeah, they'd make an example out of you or me. Right. That's exactly right. So, you know, and but the problem with that is, is when this system, when we're standing on a system of sand, a system of lies, the consequences of failure are going to be too great to bear for the average American individual. And there's going to be a lot of people that are walking in obliviously, walking down the road, oblivious to what's taking place, and they're going to get hit in the mouth with a baseball bat. Mm -hmm. Our job and your job, you do a wonderful job of, of warning people, showing them the facts, doing the research, getting out there and letting them have the truth and giving them the option of embracing the courage of the truth and trying to apply that in their lives. What we try to do is help people develop plans in place. Okay, hey, we're going to follow money flows. We're going to look at these things. We understand it may be three, four, or five years. It may be three, four months before this comes to fruition, and our, our house of cards falls or the sand that our foundation is built on falls below. But if you've got a plan in place and you've got, a strategy which can give you an opportunity to sidestep those declines, you can better prepare yourself and your family and put yourself in a position to where good men and women can take over because they'll have the resources to do so. Because I can tell you, there's no doubt with the corruption that's behind the system, when, when those in power realize that things coming apart, they're going to offload their shares on the average retail individual who's going to be euphoric thinking that, hey, what's happened for the past is going to continue to happen for the future. And it's our job to to do the work and manage the resources and stay on top of things to give those that we serve every opportunity to be able to protect themselves when this comes apart. We have no clue when it is. And we're not going to be able to navigate it perfectly. And I know we're not the only ones out there that are trying to do this, but but it's important that people embrace that truth and say, hey, we're going to put a plan in place. We're going to do the best we can. We're going to have our physical gold over here as our insurance. We may have some, not recommendations, guys, just talking about examples, you know, some exposure to crypto. We're going to diversify through areas, and then we're going to structure everything to protect ourselves as best we can from the great taking. Like Chris, I, I've, I've not been a believer in type two margin accounts. That's one of the reasons we've not run option strategies because of my concern about um, the derivatives complex, you know, when Warren Buffett says they're weapons of mass financial destruction, mm -hmm. it's by God's grace. Now, when I look back, it's like, Oh, thank you, Lord, that, that, that I didn't move down that path of using options and derivatives as our, as our strategy, because that's at greater risk, right? So you've really got to look at the way we're doing things in your accounts and stay away from type two margin accounts because they carry greater risk than the type one accounts do. But, you know, all of us have to make and, and Can I explain that out? Go right ahead. Yes. For people, just keep, keep your thought, but I just want to make sure everybody's following along. Um, so in, in uh, the great taking series that I've done, uh, it, you can find this other places. What Paul's talking about is that there are really just two types of brokerage accounts. I mean, you go down to Charles Schwab, you, you, you know, formerly TD Ameritrade or Fidelity or something. You open a brokerage account. There's two types of accounts you can open. And one is a type one or a cash account. And those, by law, the, that's rule uh, 15C3-3. By law, the, the brokerage has to maintain uh, those for you. 
right? So if you have 100 units, they're supposed to keep 100 units. There's some ways that could go a little bit wrong, but for the most part, that's done deal. If you have a margin account, now this is great. You can trade options, right? You can go long, you can short, you can borrow against that. Cool. Fun accounts. Um, by the way, if you're in Robinhood, 100%, you have a margin account, right? Oh. They, don't, they don't do cash accounts. Oh, I, I don't right? do Robinhood, but I did not realize that. I've, I've got a son just that's got a Robinhood just, account. I got to tell him that. Just filling people in. So when you do that, there, you, if you know, there's this 50 plus page thing and you sign and it says clearly in there when you have a margin account, they're like, we're going to borrow your shares and we're going to lend them out and your bonds and your cash. We're going to do whatever we want to do with all this stuff. And by the way, if it all goes away, that's on kind of on you. And by the way, we're loaning your stuff out as collateral and we might in blah, blah, blah. So there's the, you, you just, you have to understand if you have a margin account, I think on some mental level, you have to say that could go to zero through no fault of my own. And it could, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a little, I, I'm a little bit more positive that you have greater protections around type one accounts. Not that that couldn't also, who knows, some giant financial accident that could get cleared mm -hmm. as well. But, um, but there's a big difference between those two account types. And, th and that's the only two that we don't have to discuss 10 other types out there. Okay. Um, right. That's it. Cash margin. Okay. Carry on. Sorry. Didn't no, just want to make sure everybody was Tracking. No, thank, you, thank you for that, Chris. I, I forget sometimes I get into conversation with you and I forget to, to explain in detail. So that was a great summary. And, and I didn't know that about Robin Hood. So that's good information for everybody to know as well. But, you know, my concern years ago was what good does it do if you stay fully invested? You're buying puts on your positions, but the derivatives complex blows up. You know, you don't have that protection that you thought you did. Then comes along the information that you've been doing and educating. And, of course, I've been reading about the great taking. And then I'm like, okay, that's an even more dangerous environment to be in. So there, there are sacrifices that we have to make. I mean, there's there's great strategies. I understand the appeal to utilizing the option strategies, but again, it's the risk. It's one thing if you know you're taking that risk. It's another thing if you don't know that you're taking that risk. So it's our job to educate people and say, hey, if you're willing to take this risk, that's fine. But we're doing our fiduciary responsibility in teaching and educating people. So, you know, we take that serious and, and, and that's the impact that we try to make in the world where we are now. And of course, you know, usually at nine o'clock at night, I'm sending Senator Ossoff and Warnock and all these others, you know, detailed letters of like, hey, wake up. You've got a chance to do something to change the direction of this country. You were elected, whether we're on the same political side or not. Right. I'm a political atheist. Do what's best for mm -hmm. the American people. Don't just tow your party line. That's where we need to be. But we're also going to have to embrace courage as a, as individuals and on a local level the courage to embrace the truth and accept reality for what it is. Because if we can't accept reality for what it is, we can't make the wise decisions that we need to make going forward to protect ourselves, our finances and our, our families and our communities. Yeah. Did this, I just want to see if you saw this. Um, I'm not sure if this might interest Okay. Hang on. But people uh, ask me. Just one second. Um, skip that this is awesome uh all right i'm just going to pull this up for us real quick so this just happened in tennessee six days ago seven days ago uh and david rogers webb was in there and they had a lawyer in there and the tennessee uh they they have a finance committee both on their house and senate side both overwhelmingly voted to amend ucc um article eight to strip away the be yes now who knows they still got to go to the larger legislature and maybe the governor you know vetoes whatever um i don't know you know but but they did they heard they heard the data and said we're going to start to unwind this stuff now south dakota tried that but it just got killed in legislature instantly mm -hmm. uh, the lobbyists got in there uh you know the oh my gosh if we don't have the ability to to tap into your collateralized assets citizen frogs and boiling blood will come out of the sky or what i don't know what they tell these people right but they, they sure do read them a riot act <laughs> every single time but we'll see but it's starting to really catch on now you know mm -hmm. and i don't know what impact that's going to have if a state decides to scramble off of that but your state you might say hey we're already behind the curve other people who care about their citizens are doing this we're trying that that reminds me that gives me information to go back to my local state representatives and start saying look i sent you this information several weeks ago actually uh, over a month ago now month and a half ago, what have you done with it? I've not had an update. You know, I mean, 
I can't individually push them and change, but I can sure pester them uh, to the point that they either stop taking my calls or, or, you know, just ignore me completely. Either way, it's an effort worth undertaking. I think this is the great trend of, of the next five, 10 years. People are asking, what can I do? And, and, you know, what something David Webb said, um, in an interview I did with him, he said, you know, we're here because we all got lazy, you know? Mm -hmm. And, I understand when things seem to be going well and we were all doing reasonably well and we had good prosperity and all that, you take your eye off the ball. And then when you finally do wake up, you're like, they did what while I wasn't paying attention. Um, and so I think it's just time for people to stand up and, and talk about what our actual rights are. This isn't some crazy fringy thing. I know you can get on an FBI watch list for mentioning this now, but uh, we have this thing called a constitution. It's got laws. If we don't like those laws, let's change them. But we're going to have to do that out front and in center. You can't just pretend that you don't like them and ignore them and you know so yeah. people still have a lot of rights in this country and i think that's the the movement i see coming forward now is people waking up and going i'm going to kind of insist that my rights are my rights you know mm-hmm. um and so if i'm in new york i'm thinking well i either vote with my feet or i stand and fight if i fight i'm going to say you know what that's taxation without representation i did not vote to give one hundred thirty-six thousand dollars a year to every illegal illegal person who comes mm-hmm. through and you can't show me a law Anywhere in the books that says I should be on the hook right. for your decision to give money to an illegal alien. It doesn't right. exist, but they're acting, they're just doing it anyway. So I think we're going to have to get unlazy in this next sets of years, you know? Well, that's a good point. And I'll tell you, you know, one of the things that unfortunately I've seen over the years and business owners that are out there listening to this will understand an employee typically doesn't steal from a business when times are tough and they're and they're fighting hard because that that owner has the time and they're in there looking at the data because they're trying to keep that business going and they're they're paying those bills and they're managing their cash flow what happens is when business is really really busy because there's two problems in business too slow and too busy you know they present different types of problems but um, it's when that business owner is really, really busy and things are going good and they've got that extra cash flow and they don't pay attention to those details. And they've got that one employee's like, well, I really need some help for my kids. I'll just borrow it for a little bit. And then all of a sudden five or $600,000 later, well, you know, it, it seems we've got that taking place in all sectors of our federal government, because like you said, the American people have been complacent. It's time for us to pay attention, and and we need to, for ourselves, the future of our country and the future of our children behind us and our, our families and nephews and nieces, and, and to be good stewards so that we pass down something better than was given to us, you know. I mean, mm-hmm. I know that's not a philosophy that a lot of people take, but one thing that's great about meeting all the peak people across the nation, it's it's given me such a hope and courage because because not just on a local level, I would say 70% of the population, 80% of the population really want to do what's right. They're just too busy in their lives and they don't recognize because they're getting so much propaganda through the mainstream media. They've not taken the time to find the alternative media yet. And they're going along thinking everything's just fine, but it's not. There's deterioration under the surface. But you have a following out there uh, through peak prosperity and individuals that will listen to you, those that you've educated and they're seeking out that are courageous, they're looking, they want to make a difference, and they're all over the nation. And and it's encouraging because we have a nationwide footprint of individuals that are like-minded that cannot like somebody and do what's right anyway, right? To treat people with kindness and say, hey, we can a- agree to disagree on this, but justice still needs to be there. Accountability still needs to be in place. You can have your freedoms, but we need justice and and to take care of our family at home first. And then when our house is in order, we can reach out and be a blessing to other families and, and uh, other places around the world. So I don't want to get too philosophical, but that's really where we got to go. And, you know, my little job in, in this world here is to help people manage prudently. So because. The problem is, is if you're too scared of the markets out there, Chris, there are people that are just, they're Mm -hmm. terrified, right? Like I've talked to people, they had bad experiences. They got wiped out in 2008. So they don't trust any advisors. They, they, and and they go park it in CDs. Well, now here we are. Inflation has just been an absolute Holocaust for them because they were way too conservative, right? So now they're, they're coming out of their shell 
but they've had such a bad experience in the past that they have a hard time trusting and seeing and operating, right? Like we're not going to uh, navigate the markets perfectly, but we're going to fight tooth and nail to make sure that you're diversified. You've got some insurance in place, and then we're going to fight every single day to try to play the game by the rules that are forced upon us with our foot real close to the exit. Because the difference between if this comes apart, when this comes apart, right? Like the system's going to come apart at some point. I just don't know if it's going to be a deflationary collapse or a hyperinflationary holocaust. I'm inclined to believe that we get the hyperinflationary holocaust before it's over. What's worked in the past is not going to work, and you have to have tools available that give you the the confidence and courage and parameters to where you can adapt your portfolio as that time comes. Because, you know, we can drive down the road going down the interstate at the speed limit halfway across this country. I can go from Atlanta nearly to San Francisco and and uh, never have to deviate. But, you know, you get in the Rockies out there, you get into Montana, there's deer, elk. I remember one time I'm driving through and a herd of elk comes down the side of the mountain and I happened to see them and I slammed on the brakes, right? One of the cars went beside me and, you know, took them out and totaled the car. It didn't hurt anybody, but you have to be aware. So that's how we manage money in the portfolio and try to help people navigate those times. And, and, and I believe it's important for people to do. There are times where we have to adapt. And this is a period of time where I'm afraid if people don't start doing things different, they're going to receive some scars that, that could potentially be life-threatening and definitely life-altering on the other side of this. So, Paul, really important financial question. Um, I approach you uh, as, as uh, one of your one of your clients, and I say, Paul, I think I need to take five thousand out to put a garden in. What would you say? Well, the first question I'd ask is, do you have some more in savings, right, to make sure that you can cover your uh, <laughs> emergency expenses? And mm -hmm. if you said yes, I've got enough to cover my expenses for twelve months, I would say absolutely. If you said, well. If I take that 5000 to put in a garden, but that's going to get me down to six months, I'm going to be like, yes, go right ahead and do it. Because I believe that's something that's very important to do. It mm -hmm. is. What if I said, I need a, I need an excavator? An excavator? Uh, if mm -hmm. you're set up with an emergency fund? Absolutely. If you know how to operate it, that's a tool. That's mm -hmm. a tool that you can utilize. That's a tool that, you know, if society came apart as we know it that's something that you can utilize i mean i actually have yeah. an a, a excavator on my farm that that i use and it's it's saved me over one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars. and you know my wife jokes about being a an excavator widow on saturdays but those are <laughs> tools that you can utilize and, yes. and and it's also a little bit of an insurance because if you get into a hyperinflationary environment most of those are produced overseas. Most of those components are produced overseas. So if you get into a situation, right, this is an extreme example, but you go back and look at Cuba, they've got cars from the 1950s that are still running now because it was not as easy to import things across the board. So yes, there's a lot of value if it fits into your overall plan. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I do think we, we're going to have to start thinking creatively about what our investments are. I know Wall Street likes to have us fully invested. It's always it's just money in the markets, but there's mm -hmm. lots of different ways to think about this now. And as you and I have been talking about, I didn't pull this chart up. I guess I'll save it for next time. But I was just looking at year to date, how we doing? And wouldn't you know it, energy very quietly as it snuck to the top of that list, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's surprising because all we hear about is the Magnificent Seven or how great these and other things are doing. But um, uh, you know, I think that energy is going to be a, a big deal going forward, particularly if these headlines ever hit, you know, where I just see, I'm looking at my chart here, oil popped from 85 to 86.28 in a couple of minutes here on some news or other. But if the Middle East gets, mm -hmm. gets a little bit more spicy, um, you know, it is the right price 86, 96, 106 or 206. It's some number much mm -hmm. higher than it currently is. Don't know what. Uh, and that has a lot of implications. There's things that do relatively well when oil's spiking in price and things that do relatively less well um mm -hmm. so you have to have to be able to navigate that when it changes that's right well and and i'm watching very closely right now we've had some breakouts that are starting to occur to occur in commodities as well mm -hmm. following the breakout that we talked about last week in gold so that's an indication that puts that on our radar we have some exposure to uh specifically pre precious metals but not a lot into commodities yet but 
that's something that could very quickly be building in the portfolio because, hey, you know, let's say this plays out very similar to it did in 2008. Markets peaked in November of 2007, had a correction into February, kind of flatlined into the summer, but you had just an absolute run of commodities in the summer of 2008, and that was something that investors had the opportunity to participate in. So they're, mm -hmm. they're some of the most undervalued assets out there, especially if inflation continues to to beat expectations and re-accelerate like it did in the 1970s. What they don't want you to invest into these big bad companies can be a good hedge um, to protect your purchasing power against inflation. And, and, and look, inflation is an evil. I mean, deflation is something that's really easy to protect yourself from. You can be prudent and you can protect yourself from deflation, right? So if you're not too heavily indebted and, you know, we have prices go down by 20%, your salary goes down by 20%, then you can survive that. But if we go forward and the cost of living goes up by 100% in six months and 100% six months after that, your salary is not going to keep up with it immediately. And there is no conservative way to protect yourself against it. So investors have to be open-minded. And pre. what I try to spend a lot of time doing is talk to people about the changes that they'll have to make depending upon which way we go so that they've had time to think about it and they can move quicker than the herd. And that's the most important thing in inflation is moving quicker than the herd. If you adapt quick enough, you can protect you and your family far better than you otherwise would be. You don't get, you don't end up hitting the herd of elk that's running down the side of the mountain uh, in a fast manner when you're driving at 75 miles an hour. Yeah. You know, it's a great point because they're talking about in headline inflation is three and a half percent. You know, what's at 8%. That's how fast our, our um, money supply is expanding right now. Mm -hmm. And the, when I say the government has a $2.2 .2 trillion deficit this year, if we have a $27 trillion GDP, that means it's 7 or 8% as well as just is deficit spending. So when the government's deficit spending 8%, that's money that goes out the door, goes out the door for goods and services, right? Your deficit spending 8%, but you only have 3% GDP, what's that 5% doing? It's inflation. Like, mm -hmm. to me, it shouldn't be a big mystery to people that we're, that inflation is here or why it's continuing to rise for a very simple reason. The federal government is deficit spending to an extraordinary degree, and the Federal Reserve is busy monetizing that debt well and above and beyond what the um, you know, rate of, of economic growth is. Mm -hmm. that's so that's right. inflationary. It sure so is. We're going to get more of it. All of our policies are planting the seeds. We planted the seeds during the pandemic. We planted the seeds from the 10 years prior to that. But just because those seeds didn't start, um, you know, producing um, plants or yielding fruit at that point doesn't mean that they weren't growing. They were just growing slow. We're at the point now where they're still planting seeds, but we're starting to grow faster. And, and, and the, the fruit of that is not going to be good for the American people. And that's absolutely true. Absolutely true. Well, um, we've come to the end of our time, Paul. I want to thank you for your time today and remind everybody that if you want to spend some time with Paul and his excellent team talking about your personal financial situation, please go to peakfinancialinvesting.com, fill out a simple form. Somebody will be in touch with you shortly. Um, so with that, Paul, thanks so much again. Always a pleasure, Chris. Good to see you. Hello, Chris Martinson. I'm the CEO of Peak Prosperity and also Peak Financial Investing. And after watching that, you're probably wondering, well, what do I do with my money? Look, you both deserve and need somebody who can talk to you about what's really going on in this world, understand the situation as it is, not be steering you towards certain things that don't make sense for you or just keep you in a game that's already ended. Look, if you want to talk to somebody about the petrodollar declining or what is happening with gold or which sectors are actually the best ones to be in, given what the Federal Reserve is up to or the federal government, you deserve to talk to somebody who can answer those and has a few gray hairs and has been there through some of the economic cycles because, hey, we're in another economic cycle, so it's good to have that experience. Fortunately, at Peak Financial Investing, what we do is we go out and we scour and we look for the very best firms out there who satisfy one thing above all else. They've got great experience coupled to great customer 
service. So if you want to come by peakfinancialinvesting.com, there's a very simple form you can fill out. Just a few fields. You hit send. What happens is an email gets triggered out. It goes to uh, an endorsed firm of ours. You will get an email back. You can then set up a phone call for a 30 to 45 minute free, no obligation, no pressure call to find out if this firm is a good fit for you and to find out if you're a good fit for the firm. It has to go both ways. And if all that matches up, this will be one of the best things that could happen to you this year. So please come by peakfinancialinvesting.com. Very simple process. We would love to help you if we can. Thanks very much.